joining us now at 2 o'clock instead of 4 o'clock, because Nick and I are only on until 4 o'clock today. John McMuller, 97.3 ESPN.com, Eagles and NFL Insider. Got a lot of quarterback news to get into today, but we got to start with Nick Foles as we bring John into the conversation because we are just days away from teams being able to franchise tag, guys. And John, there's a lot of speculation that the Eagles could, and not just could, but would franchise tag. So give the audience an idea of the positives and negatives for the Eagles if they were to franchise tag Nick Foles. Well, I, I don't see much positive, to be honest, uh, when you look at the landscape. And I think it's it remains unlikely. Uh, $25 million is is going to be the franchise tag, somewhere around that, right around that range. Uh, and you have to think to yourself, well, if you put the tag on Nick Foles and you try to trade him, which is <laughs> – from a CBA standpoint, problematic because the franchise tag is supposed to be used for players you want to keep. So if you get over that first hurdle, the second hurdle is uh, how do you get another organization to agree to $25 million and give you something of, of value and substance in return? Uh, I don't know if it's going to happen. I really don't. I've said from the start, to me, the more logical way to go about this is to let him hit free agency, sign a deal, uh, and get back the supplemental pick in 2020. Uh, it's it's going to be really difficult for the Eagles to find uh, a suitor to want to pay that money uh, and get something back, but their goal is to steer him out of the division, and we'll see if Howie Roseman plays a game of chicken. Because the worst case scenario is you you put the franchise tag on him, there is no interest, you can't trade him, and then you're stuck paying a backup quarterback twenty five million dollars, which not only is not tenable, uh, but it, it creates this atmosphere with Carson Wentz that we've seen. Uh, and, and some of his issues involving insecurity, they only heighten if Nick Foles stays here. We've already seen the fact that you look at what the Eagles' options are now, considering they are apparently they are going to try to franchise him and trade him, of course. I mean, that's, that would be the ideal scenario. But as you mentioned, it's a huge cap hit in terms of the $25 million plus you got to think that one of their possible trade par- or potential trade partners in the Denver Broncos is out, considering they already have Joe Flacco and they, d- they just traded for him the other day. It seems like the Eagles' options are completely limited at this point, and they might as well just let him walk. Yeah, I, if you really look at it, Jacksonville uh, and Miami, perhaps, that's about it. And, and the third and fourth teams would be the Giants and, and Redskins, and... Uh, they don't. They don't want Nick Foles in the division. So uh, it's really, really limited. Uh, there's some talk uh, of the John Gruden, and uh, we all know how he falls out of love with quarterbacks and in love with quarterbacks. Maybe they would want to move on from from Derek Carr, but that's unlikely. Uh, not a lot of options. So I, I, I just. From the moment, uh, and, and I forget whether it was Schefter or Rappaport, I forget who said it first, that the Eagles are likely to tag Nick Foles. I never believed it, uh, and I still don't believe it. I could be wrong. We'll, we'll know February 19th. They have two weeks, uh, and, and that's what they would have to do to trade him. Uh, I don't think that's the likely scenario. John, we talk a lot about what the Eagles want, but what does Nick Foles really want? Like, what what does Nick Foles really want to do moving forward? Because we know that he wants to be a starting quarterback, but does he want to be a starting quarterback for a couple of years, for the next several years? I mean, this is the guy just a few years ago who talked about retirement. Yeah, I, I mean, he does want to lead a team. He's admitted that. Uh, I think. Uh, the farther we get away from uh, what he went through in St. Louis uh, and and how bad that was for him, uh, he starts to forget about it, I think. 
time heals all wounds. So from his standpoint, he just wants to be a starting quarterback in this league. And he'll get that opportunity uh, in free agency. Um, it, it makes it more difficult if they put the franchise tag on him. He obviously, which is the reason he bought back his free agency with the mutual option, would like as many suitors as possible. And, and just from uh, a personnel standpoint, he is a system quarterback. I don't know if he realizes that or not. I, I, I If I look at this landscape, the team I would probably want to go to is the New York Giants because of Saquon Barkley and Odell Beckham Jr. But uh, obviously the Eagles don't want that part of it to happen. John, do you foresee any scenario where because we, 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 we all know how much Nick Foles loves Philadelphia. We get he wants to lead a team, but it seems like he's on cloud nine at this point with the Eagles fan base, with the organization, and with himself considering he won this franchise's first Super Bowl. He came in and filled in last season valiantly and led him to another playoff victory. Is there any scenario where he would actually be content in taking, I guess, sort of a pay cut or taking a decent amount of money to be the backup in Philadelphia? Or do you think the Eagles at this point would just rather get him out of there even if they would bring him back as a backup? Well, I, I think if there's no interest elsewhere, he'd prefer to be a backup here rather than anywhere else. But I don't think that's uh, uh, going to happen. I, I do think he's going to get an opportunity to be a starter. So uh, I think that's kind of pie in the sky to assume he would rather come back here than be a starter somewhere else. Again, he's said it on the record a couple of times. He wants to lead a football team. Uh, and and then you have the other part of it. I don't think the Eagles want to go through this again. I really don't. And you can put as much stock in the phillyboys.com story as you want or, or not put anything into it. Uh, but Carson talked, and he admitted it was difficult for him. And the last thing this organization wants to go through is this again with with – people questioning Carson Wentz, they've made their decision. And and they've put uh, everything behind Carson Wentz. He's the face, face of the franchise. You may not like that, Nick Foles fans out there. You may not agree with it, but that's where this organization is. And I don't think they want to go through uh, what they've been going through again because I think they believe, and I believe they're right, they believe it's affecting Carson Wentz and his psyche. John, I wanted to transition into something on the national stage. Now, Antonio Brown's obviously been in the news because he requested a trade from the Steelers. It appears his time is in Pittsburgh is going to be up. Uh, but, however, I, I just noticed this uh, from Ian Rappaport just a few minutes ago. He did say there's a development in the story that Antonio Brown is actually going to meet with owner Art Rooney II, I guess, just, just to show a little respect. Do you, do you, do you see a, any possible scenario now where the Steelers end up keeping him and Antonio Brown actually ends up wanting to stay there? Or do you actually think the Steelers will continue to try to look for trade partners and get him out of there before the 2019 season? Well, I think you have to see if they can repair it. And as long as he's there, there's always that opportunity where people can sit down and cooler heads prevail. Obviously, it's a really good team. And one of the reasons why is Antonio Brown and offensively, and if you think about the logical landing spots for him, places like San Francisco, Arizona, uh, not nearly as good of football teams, not nearly as good as supporting cast. So maybe Brown comes to his senses from that standpoint. Uh, and then from the Steelers' perspective, they wanted him out of there. Uh, because of the off the field stuff, but they can't get a lot back for him because of the con back for him because of the contract, uh, and you're not going to get value for a top five receiver. You're going to get a mid round pick if that. Uh, and is that how badly you want to get rid of him? So hopefully the owner can step in and repair the situation. It would be the best scenario for both sides, to be honest. John, it's been suggested that part of the reason why Brown has had this fracture with the organization is because this has been going on for a while. There's been conjecture that because the Steelers have shown so much favoritism and leniency toward Roethlisberger, where they haven't given other players the same sort of leniency, that that might be part of the reason why Antonio is so exasperated in 
Pittsburgh, do you buy into that? Do you think Roethlisberger, how they have treated him, is part of the reason why Antonio feels the way he does? Or do you think that that perspective is blown out of proportion? No, I, I, I don't think it is. That's part of it. And, and from that part of it, uh, Antonio's got to grow up. Uh, that's what happens in this league. The quarterback is the face of the franchise. We just talked about Carson Wentz and the Eagles paying deference to him. That's what happens in this league everywhere. And right now, he's got a Hall of Fame quarterback uh, in Ben Roethlisberger. If you go to uh, San Francisco, for instance, well, people might believe in, in Jimmy Garoppolo, and, and far too many do, uh, without you know a, a, a large sample size uh, to, to know or understand he's going to be a top-level quarterback. But even in that type of situation, guess what? The quarterback's going to be more important than you. Even in Arizona with Josh Rosen, the quarterback is more important. And it's going to be that way in every single city. And at least in the city you're in now, you've got a Hall of Fame quarterback. So this has happened with receivers and skill position players a lot. And they look at it and say, you know what, I'm better than the quarterback, and maybe you are. But guess what? It doesn't matter. That's the most important player on the team, and that's how this league works. Speaking of the league, John, the news just came down as we were bringing you on the air. So last night, the news came out from the AP and confirmed by Darren Ravel that uh, the AAF had reached out to Colin Kaepernick. Kaepernick wanted more than $20 million to play the AAF. Well, today, the statement came out from Mark Garagos, his attorney, saying that they are going to settle out of court that the Reed and Kaepernick grievance case against the NFL has been ended. Also, the NFL and the NFLPA just released a joint statement saying, quote, for the past several months, counsel for Kaepernick and Reed have engaged in ongoing dialogue with representatives of the NFL. As a result of those discussions, the parties have decided to resolve the pending grievance. The resolution of this matter is subject to confidentiality agreements, so there will be no further comment from any party. So it seems like, John, at least from a legal perspective, the Kaepernick saga is coming to an end. Yeah, I mean, and I've said this from the start, it was it was from his standpoint, it was not a winnable case from a, from a legal perspective, whatever people think personally. Uh, it was going to be impossible uh, to prove collusion uh, from that legal standpoint, from that legal bar, uh, especially when a guy like Eric Reed uh, signs a deal, uh, has been offered deals. Uh, Colin has been offered deals. Uh, other players who, who are uh, very heavily involved in social activism, the best example of that is, is in our city with our team, Malcolm Jenkins. Uh, not only is he highly paid, he's highly regarded, uh, and he does more from an activist standpoint than Colin Kaepernick ever did. So it, it, it was an unwinnable case, and this sort of saves space at least a little bit. John, when you look at it, a lot of times legally, things get settled out of court because the case may not be going the way one side or the other wants it. And you mentioned how hard it is to prove collusion. I think that what gets overlooked in this whole situation and, you know, people have their opinions about the protests and the kneeling and about Kaepernick, how he went about it. But what cannot be denied is all the reports which have not been denied, John, the fact that he had to work out for the Seahawks, the reports that he said he wanted to compete with Russell Wilson for the starting job, the fact that the Ravens wanted to bring him in and then decided not to after his girlfriend put out that basically a racist tweet on Twitter, the fact that Kaepernick has had teams at least give some interest in bringing him in, the AAF had interest in bringing him in, and he's not denied any of that. And I think part of the problem, at least from my perspective, John, is that if you're trying to prove collusion, that means nobody has interest in you. And I think that this idea that nobody had interest in him at all is less about him and about the fact that he, at the end of his time with the 49ers, was a limited quarterback who had regressed since Harbaugh left San Francisco. Yeah, no question. And and what obviously the AAF stuff has nothing to do with the NFL or, or the grievance, but there's a clear indication there. I mean, one thing, and I, I've said this from the start and I've talked about it, I've written about it, 
I, I said nobody knows because Colin won't go on record. What's he willing to play for? Is he willing to play for the veteran minimum? And and then I, I think there's a, an education problem and uh, from the casual audience that doesn't understand. Look, you you might believe he deserves ten million dollars or twenty million dollars, but if somebody offer, offers you a one year deal at the veteran minimum. Uh, and you don't accept it, well, that's not going to help your collusion case. Uh, Being underpaid is not evidence of collusion. Uh, I think people don't understand that. I think people don't understand what collusion is. That means essentially that at least two entities got together and discussed and said, we're not going to sign Colin Kaepernick. So an example would be Roger Goodell instructing Baltimore or Seattle to not sign him or, or the owners uh, of the Ravens and, and, and the 49ers getting together and saying, you know what, we don't want this guy in our league. We're not going to, to go in that direction. And that's simply not true. And everybody knows it's not true. And, and one of my pet peeves is the people who are educated to how this league works, uh, sort of fueling that narrative. It, it's, it's, it's disingenuous, to be honest. And John, just to, just just to kind of go back a little bit to the AAF report in terms of with Colin Kaepernick, it, it just seems like, at least from my perspective, I wanted your take on this. You look at what Kaepernick has gone through the past few years, and again, the collusion case. Now that now that it's settled, and like you were saying, you really can't prove collusion if he's been offered interest to try to get back into the NFL. Does the fact that apparently he he wanted twenty million dollars for the from the AAF to play for them? Do you think that's an indication of where you think Kaepernick thinks he's worth, or do you think he's throwing out a huge number just like that because simply maybe he doesn't even want to play football anymore? Because he's been he's been out of football for what two three years now. Yeah, I think the latter uh, because I think as uh, Josh pointed out, he is a, a flawed quarterback, and you have this group that sort of believes he's still a top tier quarterback for whatever reason, uh, and he's not. And I think if he gets on the field. <laughs> that's kind of proven as it was the last time he he played for the 49ers where people kind of forget how bad he was under that Chip Kelly team. Uh, so that's part of it. And and from the AAF standpoint, look, they they, they pay everybody in that league $70,000 a year. Uh, if you ask for $20 million, you don't want to play in that league. And that that's your right. I mean, he doesn't have to pay for $70,000. Uh, but if that's what you're looking for in the NFL, look, I, I just talked about Nick Foles getting $25 million under the franchise tag. I don't think he's worth $20 million, never mind Colin Kaepernick. So, uh, yeah, if he wants that kind of money, he doesn't want to play football. I, I, I guess to just kind of wrap, wrap that up, I mean, the, the notion that he can't play anymore, I mean, I, I don't necessarily believe that he can't play anymore. He's probably better than, you, know, you, you look at, I guess, so you look at the two-man depth charts for all the uh, all the quarterbacks in the NFL. He's well, pl- yeah, but he's, let, yeah. Me just, let me just interject. Right. I agree with you. Yeah. I think he could be a backup in this league. But to be a backup in this league at, at his stage of his career, you're talking maybe the high level, $7 million. As a top right. tier backup, is he willing to pay for play for that? Right. So that, that so, I don't know. So that so that that's probably so he's probably throwing out those figures then to saying you know I'm fine I'm, I'm content with, with where my career is at now in terms of post football. So I, I at, at least at, at least that, that's how I interpret it. And I guess you know him basically turning down the AAF because he wanted twenty million dollars and the fact that he's turned down he's luckily he's the one who's been turning down opportunities from the NFL. It, to me, that has to mean he does not want to play anymore, despite the fact that he probably could play in the league still. But I guess the outside perspective just, just doesn't quite see that in terms of his collusion case, which obviously now is settled. Well, yeah, and and you'll see it every every time you see it. I'll use Josh Johnson Johnson as an example. When the Redskins bring him in, you, you'll you'll see the. Uh, the immediate tweets and everybody's saying, oh, look at the NFL. They signed Josh Johnson. They don't even look in Colin Kaepernick. But what they don't understand is Josh Johnson's playing for the veteran minimum. Uh, and he agreed to come in 
uh, for a couple games at the end of the season due to injury standpoint and, 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 and play at that level for that type of pay. Colin, from all indications, and this is uh, a clear indication again with the AAF, would not be willing to do that. So the argument itself from that standpoint doesn't get out of the starting gate, so to speak, because when NFL teams sign the Josh Johnsons of the world, the Tom Savages of the world, all those types of quarterbacks where everyone and everyone correctly says Collins better than they are, nobody's really arguing that. Is he willing to pay? Is he willing to play for what they're paid? Is he willing to play as a third string quarterback? Is he willing to fit into the scheme? Is he willing to not say, I want to compete with Russell Wilson? Because guess what? If Seattle's bringing you in as a backup quarterback, they don't want their backup quarterback saying, I want to compete with Russell Wilson. That's not how this works. So it it has been a very one-sided argument from a certain group of, of people, to be honest, pushing an agenda based on ideology. John McMullen or 97.3 ESPN.com Eagles NFL Insider. Follow him on Twitter at JF McMullen on Twitter and check out all of his work at 97.3 ESPN.com. John, hope you have a great weekend and we'll talk to you Monday. Hey, thanks guys.